Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Texas will turn 200 in not too long uh, from now. And we are delighted that we're gonna find out more about it from Margaret Spellings, who is president and CEO of Texas 2036. Uh, she's going to uh, bring her uh, exceptional knowledge and experience uh, to tell us all about what's going to happen between now and 19 or 2036. Uh, most recently, uh, Margaret uh, served as president of uh, the 17 institutions which fall under the University of North Carolina system. Uh, prior to that, she was president of the George Bush Presidential Center here in Dallas. And uh, we knew her most prominently uh, when she served as U.S. Secretary of Education under George W. Bush uh, from 2005 to 2009. Uh, she's also served as the president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, Commerce Foundation. Uh, she's a native of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and uh, spent most of her childhood in Houston and is a graduate of the University of Houston. Houston. She uh, currently resides in Dallas. We are delighted that uh, Margaret Spellings can join us today and let us learn more about our birthday. Good morning. I'm Margaret Spellings and I'm the president and CEO of Texas 2036. It's terrific to be with you all this today. I don't know if it's this morning or not. Uh, and I really appreciate all the great work that Rotary Clubs all over the world do, especially you all here in Dallas. These are times that are challenging and really call on all of us and our spirit of volunteerism to step up and make our communities better as you all do every single day. So I'm thrilled to be with you to talk about the future of Texas. And we are unveiling soon uh, a strategic framework for Texas that we're calling Shaping Our Future. An exercise like this was done in the early 80s uh, by then Governor Bill Clements, and it resulted in a report called Texas 2000. And it had a quote as the introduction to that document that really stands as true today as it did then. And we love it because it talks about our great longstanding asset as Texans, and that is the determination to shape our own destinies. And never has that been more important than it is in these challenging days uh, that we live in. Texas 2036, as some of you may know, living in Dallas, was founded by our, our fellow citizen, Tom Luce, in the fall of 2016. And since then, he and we have been working to build a long-term sustainable organization with a board of directors, expert staff, and the significant financial support needed to go the distance. Our board uh, is comprised of Texans from all over our state and fully representative of many industries, of ethnicities, gender, and geographies, and we are really proud of them. Uh, you'll recognize some of the local names on this slide, including Ron Kirk, who served as President Obama's trade representative, uh, Hunter Hunt of the Hunt Companies, uh, uh, Nicole Small, who leads the Lida Hill Foundation, uh, and many other uh, local leaders. And we are proud of the work they are doing on behalf of our state. When we look at uh, Texas 2036, a couple of things really differentiate us. First, we are looking across the whole of public policy in Texas. We know that educated people are healthy people and vice versa. We know that if we have the right supports for early uh, learning, that that will pay big dividends over time and support our workforce system generally, to name a couple of examples. And the other major differentiator of Texas 2036 is that we are all about the data. We have, since our founding, uh, cur curated and, and accumulated more than 300 publicly available data sets, and we are using them to guide the way forward and to tell us where we have work to do and where we have can congratulate ourselves. We want to make sure that Texas is the best place to live and work now and into our bicentennial in 16 years. So where are we today? 
Texas is a big state, well-located, diverse economy. We know all of that. Uh, 29 million people in Texas, and we will grow by another 10 million people by our bicentennial in just 16 years. During that time, we will get increasingly older, I guess if we're lucky, and younger, more urban, and more diverse. And it is a terrific hand to play if we maximize the full potential of our fellow Texans. But we have a lot of work to do in order to meet that challenge. What are some of the challenges? What does the data tell us about the things we need to work on? One of the things that's most prominently before us in these days of COVID are, uh, is our healthcare system and our health policies. We know that spending is on the rise and has been for some time, but our outcomes are not terribly encouraging. You can see the chart on the right tells us where we rank uh, amongst the states on these important health outcomes. Further, we lead the nation in the number of uninsured adults and children, both in percentage terms and in raw numbers. So clearly we have work to do on healthcare, yes, but also on public health. We are seeing the importance of our public health platforms in these days of COVID. We also are learning more about broadband penetration in these days of COVID because it is an important asset as we educate our children from our homes and communities, as well as uh, try to use telemedicine more broadly. And to make that happen, obviously we need ubiquitous high-speed 5G broadband. You'll see from the map on the left that it is certainly an issue in rural Texas, especially west of I-35, uh, with reduced populations of, of individuals with access to that capability. But in our urban areas where broadband is available, it becomes a real affordability issue. And you all have been reading about that, I know, as we talk about students learning from home. Four of our major cities are among the worst connected in the United States. This is a gap we must close if we're to leap ahead in developing our people, especially in times of challenge as we are in now. As you can see, we have work to do in reading. <clears throat> this is our national ranking of <clears throat> how we do in fourth grade reading on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. That is the gold standard education report card. And while we have always had work to do with our large and growing and diverse and uh, often poor po student population, we have been going the wrong direction of late. We all know that if you can't read uh, with capability and facility early in your schooling, it is a great impediment to your success throughout your life. And so while we are proud that the legislature has acted in the last session on important reforms and House Bill 3, this is an area we really need to keep an eye on. And of course, many of those reforms and the investments that were made are uh, under threat because of the financial constraints our state will face. So seriously, an issue that we need to pay attention to. So I highlight those few challenges that we, that we uh, face, but we I have also looked at many other indicators across a set of policy pillars, and I'd like to talk about them now. Our strategic framework identifies goals across six policy areas, a couple of overarching goals. <clears throat> it assesses uh, with real data behind it, how we're doing on each of those goals, and then puts those against a set of peer states that I'll talk more about. <clears throat> we also set targets about how far we can get between now and our bicentennial in Texas in 2036. <clears throat> we set ourselves out to achieve 36 strategic goals for Texas. What do we even aspire to? What are our North Stars against these most important policy areas? You will see on the left in the orange, uh, education and workforce, health, infrastructure, as well as two indicators, <clears throat> economic growth and quality of life, 
together uh, supported by success along the way by these other policy pillars. On the second page, you'll see the remaining North Star aspirations across natural resources, justice and safety, and how well we run our $250 billion enterprise we call Texas in a set of goals around government performance. When you look at goal 19 at the top of that page, it says quality of air. Texans have clean air. Is that something we can aspire to? And where do we stand now? So I'm gonna walk through one example about how we have thought about this structure and this taxonomy, if you will, so that when this is unveiled, you'll be able to understand it easily. As I said, we set ourselves against a set of peer uh, states for uh, the states that we compete with for business, for talent, and those states that have assets like size and scale and ports, geography, similar demographics, and so forth. And there's a lot of uh, methodology under those three buckets of comp competition. The states on the right uh, in the yellow and Texas in blue are those peer states and together we make up 58% of the total population and 62% of the total uh, US GDP. So that is the race, that's the space race that we are in to compete for talent, for business, and to ensure prosperity. So let's talk about the framework and how we've laid out our objectives, how we've done this work. And the example I'd like to use is around education and workforce. No matter who you talk to, everyone cares about this, whether you're a parent, an employer, uh, whatever business you're in, a qual the quality of our workforce in Texas is essential to your own growth and prosperity. So it's a real uniter. Uh, education and workforce has a vision that says Texans have the knowledge and skills needed to succeed in the 21st century. That seems like a reasonable objective. Under that overarching goal, we lay out five subparts, early learning, K-12, post-secondary, jobs, and workforce needs. And we use a red, yellow, green uh, framing so that we can assess how are we doing. So on early learning, I'll talk about that in a second. You can see we are, are a red. Those are, the, those are our five objectives under that vision. We also have trends that are captured in those diamond shapes that show whether we're improving, whether we're flat, or whether we're going in the wrong direction. And this is important because often, while we may be improving, we're not improving as fast as our peer competitors. So it's a race in all of these. The example I want to use with you all is early learning, goal three which says Texas children get a strong early start to succeed in school and in life. And in each section, you will find this common framing, Texas today and tomorrow and context. In Texas today and tomorrow, it talks about why that particular indicator is important. What is the meaning of it? Why is this a priority for us, our state? And where are we now in a narrative sense? On the context section, it talks about things that you're gonna to wanna to know about what's at play currently. So for example, in this section, we speak to the reforms that the legislature enacted last session. In the section on resiliency, we talk about COVID and hurricanes, but it is a, a common framing throughout the document that gives a little bit of an orientation and allows lay readers to easily consume uh, the, the work we have put before them. In early learning, we have two primary indicators. Throughout this document, there are 57 primary indicators and another about 110 secondary indicators that are also important and that are, will be part of our digital tools available to the public around the 1st of June. In this, in this objective, we have two primary indicators, third grade reading, that is on our STAR state assessment, our criterion reference test. And you will see that we are 45% of our students read proficiently and that that has been a flat trend. You'll also see the demographic 
breakdown on the bottom of that left hand side and it speaks to where we need to be in early reading. We also have an indicator and this is a national comparator, our NAEP test uh, in fourth grade reading that shows that we are number 12 against our peers. Uh, 11 other states do better than we do and we have been flat over time. So others are improving more quickly than we are. And as I say, those peer states are not dissimilar in terms of uh, demographics and other challenges. One of the things that we are so proud of in our work at Texas 2036 is our uh, reliance, our allegiance, and our fealty to the data. What do the facts tell us? And I think all of us are obsessing these days about COVID data. And so we have uh, worked to, at the request of Governor Abbott's strike force, to bring some of that information forward to the public. And you can find that tool at covid19.texas2036.org. All right. We have the, on the reopening analysis, we have looked at how are we, and if uh, I could ask that that be opened. against the criteria that the White House has set. They have said that there are six things that states need to do, including uh, a downward trajectory over a 14 day period, uh, among other things. So you will find those White House indicators and how we're doing as a state, and also find that data uh, on a county level as well. So that's the reopening section. On the County Explorer, you'll find granular data like beds available, uh, ER visits, syndromic uh, uh, prevalence, lab testing, and those sorts of things. And here you see Dallas County in that framing. I know this is, is uh, going quickly, um, but you can see a map of Texas and how Dallas County is doing. The darker the orange, uh, the more uh, prevalent COVID cases are. You'll see up there in Amarillo in Potter County uh, a, a, a red county. There's a meat packing plant there and other challenges that they face. But we think this is important data because it allows policymakers and the public to see how we're doing. The other thing that's important is that in addition to these health outcomes, we're also looking at business closures, business reopenings, unemployment claims, and those sorts of things that if I could ask those to be called up, you'll see as well. This is statewide uh, data, but we also have this by county, jobless claims, business closures, hourly employees uh, working. And we will continue to fill this tool with additional data like school openings and the like. This is a very organic tool and it has been made possible by strong cooperation from the State Department of Health and Human Services, as well as our partners at the Dell Medical School. So I commend this tool to you. It can be found on our Texas 2036 website and I think you will find it fascinating. If you're like me, you're consuming uh, all sorts of data as quickly as you can to have a full understanding of uh, where we are and, and how we should act personally and as business and civic leaders. So where do we go from here and what can you do to uh, get engaged with the future of Texas. As I say, we will publicly release this strategic framework around the 1st of June and wanted to give you and other organizations like yours a sneak preview of how we've been thinking about this. We'll also continue to engage with our fellow citizens across the state uh, on these indicators and these priorities. And obviously, uh, while we had planned in-person events across the state, uh, we'll be doing many of those uh, uh, via technology and hope to return to those in-person meetings later this year. We're also at work on developing a 2021 legislative agenda. And certainly things are, are uh, uh, burbling to the top uh, as we think about that. Some of the things that I mentioned earlier, like broadband access, 
and like the uh, strength of our public health systems as well as how well our government performs and is prepared and is resilient in times of challenge. We will also continue to meet with elected and appointed leaders to share this data with them. Uh, we think these are powerful tools for policymakers. As our, our founder, Tom Luce, likes to say, without data, you're just a person with an opinion. And uh, we want people to be armed with the best possible information as we chart these uh, treacherous waters ahead. We will certainly have real revenue challenges in our state and, a lot, and many, many needs. And so we'll need to make sure that we're as clear-eyed as we can possibly be as we prioritize the use of resources against those priorities for the future of our state. Thank you for your attention today. I would look forward to being with you all at some point in person. And I appreciate uh, your interest in the future of Texas and Texas 2036. And again, your great work that you do in this community and around the world. Thank you, Rotary. Margaret, thank you very much for sharing that program with us today. And I've got to tell you, there's, there's good news and there was bad news in, in Margaret's presentation. And kind of being a, and being a bean counter, I'm kind of a numbers person. So needless to say, I go straight to the numbers. And there's some numbers there that concern me that should concern all of us that I think we just don't think about what we need to focus on and work toward. One of the things, and you particularly look at where we're at now with illness, is Texas ranks at almost the bottom. It was having the most uninsured citizens in the state of any state. and and, and you wonder what, what has created that. Why with the employment and such being what it is, do we have so many people uninsured? So that's certainly a question that needs answers and hopefully we can figure that out. The other thing that always bothers me is how we rank in education. There's some places where we're very weak and I think Margaret's presentation pointed those out. Um, Margaret, thank you, that was a great program. I wish, you know, this is one of those times that I wish you could have been here Wish, there was, wish this would have been face to face because I know everyone like me had questions they would have liked to have asked you and heard your responses to. So we look forward to you at some point in the future coming back to when we're back in the city club meeting again. Margaret, thank you very much for a great program.